Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here today. Announcements are in your bulletin insert. Uh, take note of all those and write anything down that you need to take note of and nothing particularly to highlight today, but just be aware of what's going on in your church so you can participate to the fullest. Uh, during the plane of the prelude, let's use this time to prepare our minds and hearts for meeting the Lord during this time of worship. Will you please stand and join in the call to worship? God is our master. Let us use all that God gives us in a way that is pleasing to Him. Our opening hymn is number 455 Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. Let's join in singing together.
Let us join our voices and our hearts together as we recite the statement of our faith called the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time you may be seated, and as the ushers come forward, we will give to the Lord our tithes and our offerings. Heavenly Father, we ask you to receive these gifts which we place upon your altar, as well as the gifts we give given throughout this past week of finances, of time, of talent, of energy. Please bless all that we offer to you in Christ's name, so that it may go to build up your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. For we ask this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we're going to go before the Lord in a time of prayer. If you have a prayer request or a praise, re uh, praise that you want to share, will you please all stand at this time so Jack can see where you are and get around the room. Um, I'm asking for prayer for Ron Smith and Linda. Ron is in, still in ICU and... Uh, Linda's been running back and forth, so they need your prayers. Keep Dick and Nellie Terrell in, in your prayers. They're both very weak. Yeah, please keep the Lutz family in prayers as Annie's passed away. 
And I'd like to ask uh, Travel Mercies as we head south uh, this week. Yeah, Ann Lotz's funeral will be Tuesday at 1 o'clock. The kneeling rail is open. If anyone would like to come forward and kneel before the Lord during this time of prayer, please feel free to come forward now. Heavenly Father, during this time of silent prayer, we each silently lift up to you the family and friends of Ann Lotz. We pray for healing and strength for Ron, who's in the hospital, and his wife, Linda. We pray for the Terrells. We pray for safe travel for all who will be traveling this week. Heavenly Father, you have given us so much. Look at all we have. We have warm, safe homes, nice cars, comfortable furniture, lots of electronics, clothing for every day of the week, enough food to make us need to lose weight, and plenty of money so we can do lots of other things that we enjoy, from eating out to vacations to hobbies and activities. We are so blessed by you, God especially when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, much of which lives in poverty and need. May we realize today, God, that you're entrusting us with great riches, carries with it great responsibility. When we look at creation, we see that everything really comes from you. And as the creator, you ask us to be good stewards of everything that you have not really given to us, but just entrusted to our care for the brief time we are here on earth. For nothing is really ours. We can't take it with us when we die. So God, help us to see that you call us to be good stewards of all that we have. Just to using all we just temporarily possess in ways that are pleasing to you. And help us to be good stewards of our financial resources. May we use all the earnings we make, which actually are not ours anyway, in ways that will build up your kingdom. This is all so you may be praised and glorified in all we do and with all we are entrusted with. Grant this, God, so when we leave all we possess behind us to come to you, that we may hear your words of praise for all we did as good and faithful servants. Help us to do this as we come to you in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time it's time for the children's message. Katie, come on down and bring the kids with you. Good morning. Hey, so this morning, you guys got some little bags, right, from Haley and I. They're your new busy bags, right? And inside your bags, you got a little story. Did you guys see your little book? Did you see your book? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in your book, okay? So when you guys think of Jesus, do you guys think of, how, what do you think about? Do you guys think that he was older? Do you think of him as young, a baby? What do you think when you think of Jesus? What, what's the picture in your mind? Somebody probably older, yeah? But did you know that Jesus, he went through all the stages that we're going through too, right? He was Brinley's age, he was Parker's age, and he was even Livy's age, right? And guess what? What do you think that Jesus liked to do when he was young? Do you think he liked to play with his friends? do things like that well when he was young and he was 12 years old him and his mom and his dad went to a temple right and when they left mary said oh no where's jesus and they had to turn around and they had to go back to the temple right and guess what jesus was doing do you think he was goofing off and being silly with his friends no what do you think he was doing livy did you read it yet no a little bit he, would, he stayed, and he was learning about the Bible, and he was talking about, about the Bible, right? He was, he was so in love with God's Word that he stayed. He, did, he wasn't in a rush to get home. He wanted to stay and learn all he could about God, right? So I want you guys to remember that you are not too young to learn about God and to love God's Word. Let's say a prayer. God, we just thank you so much for giving us Jesus, to give us the human kind of you, to learn about you and to be more like you. God, we just thank you for all of our blessings every single day. In your name we pray, amen. To prepare our minds and hearts for receiving the sacrament of communion, let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our joy to give thanks to you in all places and at all times, Almighty Father. You are the source of all truth, life, and love. You made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When in our sinfulness we turned away from you and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven forever singing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to the world. Your Spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father, receiving these gifts of bread and juice with thanksgiving for the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and partake of his most blessed body and blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one as your church, that Christ may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and gather us together with all your saints in the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. We ask this through your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit and your holy church be our honor and glory now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. This is the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that was shed for us. We have four people who will be serving the elements to you in the front. Will they please come forward at this time? The sacrament of communion is open to all who have faith in Jesus Christ and wish to draw near to him, remembering what he did upon the cross for our salvation and receiving again the gift of the Holy Spirit to bless us as we draw near to him. There are also gluten-free elements that I will have available here in the middle, if that's what you desire. We'll start at the back in the middle sections. Please come forward down the center aisle. You may receive the elements or return to your seats by way of the side aisle. Then when the middle sections are done, the side sections can come down the middle aisle as well and return back to your seats. The table of the Lord is open. Come if you so desire.
Okay, if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 25, this morning's scripture reading begins with verse 14. Also pull out your uh, notes and your bulletin insert. You can take notes and write down, uh, fill in the blanks and write down other inspirations that you get as we go through the message today. Matthew 25, begin with verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and gave it to the one who has the 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and who have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Today, if you haven't guessed it yet, I am preaching about one of my favorite topics, one of the things I like to preach on. I do this at least every year, maybe a couple times a year in the churches I'm in. Uh, the subject I like to preach on is the topic of money. A lot of pastors don't like to talk about money, but I do. I think that's an important thing to talk about. And actually, to tell you the truth, I'm shocked. I am shocked there are not 500 people in this room right now. How many times have I talked to people and they say, well, I don't go to church. Every time I go to church, they always talk about money. This is it. They should all be here, right? then they could leave and say again, I went to church, all he talked about was, was money. So there should be 500 people here. I don't know where they're at. Realize, though, that this is not really a message about money. I say it is, but it really isn't. It's really a message about discipleship. Here's the first thing I want you to realize. Write this down on your notes. It is impossible to be a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ without also being a fully committed steward of your financial resources. The two go together. We see in this morning's scripture reading, all three servants were in the employ of the master. Their job was to care for the master's property and resources. That includes the money. Money, uh, the talent back then was a unit uh, of money. And it was a, a talent was a pretty substantial amount maybe possibly thousands of dollars each. In other words, these, uh, this master and his stewards were rich, just like us. We are rich people. Every single one of us in this room is rich. That became abundantly clear to me about 15 years ago. It became clear before that, but I had a great experience 15 years ago. A group of us pastors went down to Nicaragua on a mission trip. One of the evenings we spent in a meeting with the Methodist pastors of Nicaragua. There are about a dozen of them down there in Nicaragua that are Methodist pastors. 
And we had a good time. There was a translator there because I don't speak Spanish. They didn't speak English. But there was a translator there. And so we were talking about uh, our jobs and what we did. And then one of them asked an interesting question. He asked, how much do you make as a pastor in Ohio? When they heard what we earned, they just about fell off their chairs. It was inconceivable for them to know how much we earn up here in the United States when they are working down there and maybe earning $100 a month. I realized I am rich compared to the rest of the world. I may not be rich compared with uh, all these other millionaires you read about in the newspaper. Those are the minority. Those are the small amount. When, I, when you look at the whole world, we are in the top uh, couple percentage points. We are the rich people of the world. Now, the two that were good stewards uh, were good stewards of what belonged to their master. They used not their money, but the master's money in a way that the master desired. And they got a reward for that. Verse 21, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Not only did they get praised, but they got rewarded with even more stuff given to them. And then there's the third servant. He knew what to do. It says, then the man who received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered seed. <clears throat> so I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. He could not plead ignorance for his lack of service in the master's name. He knew the money did not belong to him. He knew what the master wanted him to do. But he was afraid. For whatever reason, he was afraid. And he had reason to be afraid. Verse 30, And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? A lot of times when we read things that are harsh, we think, well, that's in the Old Testament where things were harsher with God. Well, no, this is New Testament. Not only is this New Testament, this is Jesus talking. This is a parable from Jesus. That teaches us this. <coughs> Excuse me. God today still asks, God today still demands that we are good stewards of this world. It means we use our financial resources in a way that pleases him. And what does a good steward do? Four things. Four things the Bible teaches us a good steward does. The first thing is this. Write this down. A good steward gives to God a tithe. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, the land, the grain, the fruit of the trees, that was their money back then because the Israelites didn't have a mint. They didn't have a printing press for, for that. So what he's saying is a tithe of everything we earn goes to the Lord. In Luke 11, Jesus said this, But how terrible it will be for you Pharisees, if you are careful to tithe even the tiniest part of your income, but you completely forget about justice and love of God. You should tithe, Yes, Jesus said, but you should not leave undone the more important things. And in Malachi 3.8, God says this, You people are robbing me, you're God. And here you are asking, how are we robbing you? You are robbing me of the offerings and of the 10% that belongs to me. Tithing has always been the standard of giving for those who follow God and who belong to God. And today is still the standard of good Christian stewardship. It's kind of like this stick. This stick represents everything you earn, whether you're talking about in the last month, last year, last five years, ten years, or whatever. This stick represents your earnings. Now, down at this end of the stick, we have the part that's black. You know what that stands for? Taxes. We don't like paying taxes, do we? but we all got 
to pay them. And as part of the expenses we have for living in a society that has a police department, a fire department, a government in Washington, well, okay, maybe we don't like that part of our taxes, but we still have it. We still have to uh, pay taxes to support it because that holds our country together, for better or for worse, is what it does. So we all have to pay taxes, and I made that part of the stick black. You can use your imagination why it's that way. Now, you have a great part here. That is, again, taxes, but that's a different way we're taxed because you get to determine how much of your taxes you pay. This gray represents your state sales tax, which right now I think is what, 7.5%? But here's the thing. You don't have to pay any state sales tax if you don't buy anything, okay? You can control this. The more you spend, the more taxes you pay. The less you spend, the less taxes you pay with state sales tax. Then you have the green. The green is the money that you get to keep for yourself, okay? This is what you uh, get to use for your mortgage, your car, your clothing, uh, food, vacations, uh, whatever you want. Uh, this is yours, which is free to use. And then you have down here the gold part. The gold is what goes to God's kingdom, and that is 10% of the whole stick. Okay, because all this, the other 90% is stuff that we benefit from. The 10% up here is for God's kingdom, for God's kingdom to benefit from that part. So a good steward gives to God a tithe, and that stick defines what the tithe is. Now, the second thing we need to realize is this. Not only does a good steward give to God a tithe, the good steward gives to God the first fruits. The first fruits. Exodus 23, 19 says, Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. In Nehemiah 10, 35, we also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. What that means is this. You give to God first rather than last. In Malachi 1, we read this. The Lord Almighty says to the priests, A son honors his father and a servant respects his master. I am your father and master, but where are the honor and respect I deserve? You would despise my name. But you ask, how have we ever despised your name? You have despised my name by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by bringing to the altar of the Lord uh, blind animals as sacrifices. Isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord Almighty. Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all? Asked the Lord Almighty. The Israelites thought that they could get away with giving God the last of their flocks. Picture a shepherd. And the shepherd is standing there with 10 sheep. And so he looks at his 10 sheep, trying to decide what he's going to do with his flock. And he looks at them and says, well, this sheep here, this is certainly the best of the flock. This is the best one. This will bring a good price on the market. I'll take that to the market this weekend, and I'll sell it and earn, earn something there. And then he looks at the other nine. He says, well, here's these other nine sheep. Uh, several of these look like they're very healthy and good. They'll be good for breeding for next year's flock. I'll keep these uh, for breeding. And then he looks at the couple that are left, and he says, well, this one or two here, these look pretty tasty. This will make a good meal for us. I'll take this home and have my wife prepare it for dinner uh, uh, this uh, Sabbath, and we'll use that for dinner. And then he comes to the last sheep. The last sheep is the worst of the ten. It's blind or crippled or diseased, and he thinks, well, I certainly can't sell this sheep. I can't breed it. it won't taste any good. And then he says, I know what I'll do. I'll give this one to God. That's the way most Christians think when it comes to whether or not they give the first fruits or not to God. Most Christians think, well, what I really want is more green for myself. And so they look at the stick and they say, I want more green. I'll slide some down here and I'll, I'll, I'll rob from down here. That's called tax evasion, okay? I do not recommend that. You will go to prison 
Don't try to get more money by cheating on your taxes. Don't ever say your pastor told you to cheat on your taxes. I did not say that, right? Okay, you got it. So if you want more green, what do most people do? They come down to this end. And they say, I'll give lastly to God with what's left at the end of my bill paying time rather than what's first at the beginning when I start paying my bills. And in fact, this is right about where the majority of Christians in the United States are. Various uh, surveys have shown that the majority of Christians give not 10% to the Lord, they give 3% to the Lord. And so that's what the giving looks like for most Christians. Not for all, but certainly for most. That's because they give to God what's left instead of what's right. What's right is giving to God first and making the rest of it fit your budget instead of waiting to pay the rest of the budget and then giving God something out of what's left over at the end of the month. One of the other things that's interesting is this. See, these same studies have found the higher the income, the lower the percentage you give to God. The higher the income, the lower the percentage. Isn't that an interesting statistic that they've shown over and over? So a good steward gives God the first fruits. Here's the third thing we know about good stewardship. The good steward gives to God at church. Malachi 3.10. I've been quoting Malachi a lot here, but it's a great verse on this. You should read Malachi at home this week. Uh, Malachi 3.10 in the message says, Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in my temple. That's because we need to realize that the tithe goes to God, not to charities. A lot of times I've heard people say, well, I give, I give this percentage, but I give some of it to Boy Scouts and some to Girl Scouts and some to Little League and United Way and the Cancer Fund. And you know what? That's all okay to support those things. In fact, that's a good thing to support other charities. But you don't rob God of his tithe by giving to other charities. Charitable giving comes out of the 90%, not out of the 10%. That is really not charitable giving, it's godly giving, because it goes to God. So what could you do if this church, if everyone started tithing? What could you do to feed the hungry of this community, or shelter the homeless, or reach the lost? You know, that's what pastors dream about at night. What could the people of God do if everyone brought a tithe to the temple? The fourth thing we realize about good stewardship is this. A good steward receives abundant blessings from God. Malachi 3.10, again, bring the full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Then he continues, test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour up blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Ezekiel 34, 26, I will cause my people and their homes around my holy hill to be a blessing, and I will send showers, showers of blessings, which will come just when they are needed. And Acts 3, 19 in the message version says, now it's time to change your ways. Turn to face God so we can wipe away your sins. Pour out showers of blessings to refresh you. God wants to bless you with showers of blessings. Blessings come when you get with God's stewardship program. Let me give you a personal testimony about Cat and me. There was a time, long time ago, when we were young, when Cat and I weren't tithing, because we said we can't afford to. And then we realized we really needed to get with God's program. This is when we would only have one income, we had two preschool children, and our, my salary was so low, we were eligible for food stamps. We were on the poverty level at that time, back in the 1970s. But we said we need to start tithing. And so we made plans to do that. And now we look back and say we are so blessed by God. God's blessings have showered down upon us for the last 45 years in so many ways. We have received spiritual blessings, We've received relational blessings in our marriage. We've even received financial blessings over and over and over again. And when we look back on our lives, 
we see really those blessings started that year we started to tithe. Coincidence? Not according to what we read in the Bible. It's not a coincidence. In fact, we look back now and we say we couldn't have afforded not to tithe when we were younger. We also understood throughout our ministry that the tithe is the floor, not the ceiling. It's not that 10% is the most you give to the Lord, it's the least that you give to the Lord. It's okay to give more than 10%. And Kat and I really took that to heart too, particularly in the later part of our lives when we were both working, our children were grown, we didn't have to support our children at all with that. And for as many years, we gave somewhere between 12 and 15% to the Lord at our church because that's how much we wanted to thank the Lord for the blessings he showers down upon us. Now, every time you read the scriptures, this is true today, this is true last week, the week before, it'll be true next week. Every time you hear them preached, you need to seek what your response to the scriptures ought to be. The scriptures always require a response from you. They call you to believe something or to say something or think something or do something. After all, James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. James 1.22 in the King James Version says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. So after hearing today's message, you have homework. Write this down at the bottom of your notes. This is your last blank. Write this down. My homework is to pray diligently about my stewardship of God's finances. That's your homework for this week. What does God want you to do as a good steward? I would guess, as a having pastor churches for 40 years and even beyond that, I would guess most of you are not tithing. There are probably some tithers in this room beyond Kat and me. I would bet there are. But I would guess most of you are not. You're not with God's program because, as I said, the average Christian usually gives about 3%. If that describes you, you need to make a change in your stewardship. So spend serious prayer time this week, individually, with your spouse. If you have children at home, you should be talking to your children about this because we taught our children from the time they started getting an allowance, which is like first, second grade or so, they tithe on their allowance every week. They had an offering envelope they put in the offering plate every week. They're up here in the front if you need them for your kids or for yourself. So you're going to ask yourselves as you talk to God, God, what do you, the master, want me to do with the financial resources you have entrusted to my care? Take your notes home from this message. Read the scripture readings that are listed on your notes every day this week. Go over them. And when he reveals what he wants you to do, and I believe he will reveal something if you're listening, ask him to give you the will to be obedient so you can be a good steward. So you can receive showers of blessings. And so you can hear God say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, you have made abundantly clear what you call us to do as stewards of your world and your finances that you simply entrust to us to take care of. Like the third steward, we cannot plead ignorance. So if we are not with your program as good stewards, we can only plead disobedience to your will. Please, God, reveal to each of us what your will is for us as your servants and give us the desire to be obedient to you, even if that means making changes and even sacrifices in our personal budgets. Grant this so we can all hear you speak words of praise to us and so we can receive showers of blessings. Amen. We're going to stay in now and sing our closing hymn, I Surrender All, number 486. I had a member of my church once who said, most people don't sing this hymn. What they usually sing is, I surrender 50%, or I surrender 22%. But the Bible calls us to surrender all. So we're going to close with singing number 486.
the love God has for us, that he would surrender his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his all upon the cross for our salvation. May that love for God be within us, that we might return that love back to God, surrendering all to him this week. Amen. Thank you.